<laughs> okay, so I would like to then start. We are just on time, no? It's 9.30 now. You have your panelists here. Okay. Um, so it is my, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our colleague, Jack Moss, uh, who is the senior water specialist in, in Aquafed and um, very hardworking and positive partner for you and water. I think I would say that. Thank you. And um, I will leave you to present your panelists and, and run your panel. Thank you very much. That's it. Good. Well, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, accidents happen in life. Um, I've got two accidents that have uh, created a little bit of difficulty for me this morning. One is that my computer collapsed last night, and the few changes that I was going to make to the, to the slides, which I found were a bit repetitive on some of the things that have been said for the last uh, couple of days, I can't change. Uh, because I can't get at them. Um, and the other accident that seems to happen is that uh, between dinner last night and this morning, I appear to have lost a panelist. Um, so we'll, anyway, we'll do, we'll do our best. But what, what I intended to do was uh, give you a bit of an overview of uh, the, the subject matter, partnerships between water and energy utilities. Um, and then I was going to do that, I hope, in a storytelling mode, um, and I have, hopefully, <laughs> three partners who will tell their story uh, very briefly, and then we will have a discussion between ourselves, uh, and then hopefully with, with you. So let me see if I can, first of all, make uh, some sense of, a, of the presentation. So what I'm going to try and talk about is partnerships between water and energy utilities. Well, my, my first problem when I looked at all this was that I actually couldn't find very many real formalized examples of partnerships between energy and water utilities. That might be because we aren't defining utility correctly, or that might be because we're not um, looking at um, partnerships correctly. So anyway, I'm going to try and run through what I see from 30 years of experience in the water industry, and so there's a water industry bias in my, my bit, um, what's similar between water and energy activities, what's different, uh, some of the key things we've talked about over the, t over the last few days, and maybe I'll skip over those, and then we have our three case studies uh, and our discussion. I thought it might be interesting to start off by telling you two little tiny stories about my own life when I joined the water industry from construction 30 years ago. One of the first things I experienced moving to uh, be shown around a water company uh, out just outside Paris in an area with reasonably reasonable degree of relief uh, and a lot of quite a high density of uh, domestic, domestic living. And I was very surprised to see that the research program of the company at the time was trying to use artificial intelligence systems 30 years ago artificial intelligence systems to try to optimize the use of the energy in the system because water is very heavy, a ton a cubic meter. Uh, electricity is very expensive at peak periods. People want to wash their faces and go to the toilet at exactly the same time as the electricity is expensive. And therefore, if you can put water on the top of the hill early in the morning, so it runs downhill when the electricity is expensive, you can make huge savings. And so this was one of the first IT experiments that I was faced with 30 years ago. So water has always been, uh, sorry, energy has always been an extremely important component of water management. Rule of thumb, 30% of operational costs is in energy, which is not the same way as water is in energy production. And I think we could also say that 
for energy production, the investments in the capital equipment, the generating stations, the dams and so on, is a hugely expensive bit, but the operating component of the energy is, is tiny, the water and energy is tiny, which is not the same thing in, uh, in, uh, in the water industry. The, what was the other story I was going to tell you? What was the other story I was going to tell them? Never mind, I won't tell you another story because I can't remember what it was. So, um, now back to the thesis. Is, first of all, our water and energy partnerships common? And I, I, it seems that they're not. Um, I say have not been able to, to find very many. And I thought, well, as I can't find very many concrete examples, cast back into my life about 15 years ago, there was a lot of, a lot of talk by the uh, consultants, the McKinsey's of this world, about multi-utilities. So perhaps I should concentrate on multi-utilities. Can I find some of those that would uh, give you the example? Well, the truth of the matter is multi-utilities is a language that you hear very little of now, and there are really not that many multi-utilities delivering water and energy around the world. Actually, I think I have one partially at least beside me, beside me here. Um, so that didn't really work. Um, I also am involved very much with the UN at the moment on the SDGs, and I thought, well, isn't it odd that there's a good water chapter in the outcome from the Rio document, there's a good energy chapter in the outcome document, but neither of the other mention the other fluid. There's no mention of energy in the water chapter and no men mention of water in the energy chapter. So perhaps these links aren't as close as they might be. But it could be that we actually don't know what we're talking about in terms of words of partnership. Well, I think we exhausted that subject yesterday, uh, Josephina, so I'm, I'm not going to go back on that one. Um, I think it's more likely that actually, certainly at the working level, the technologies are not terribly compatible uh, it's a, an old uh, truism that energy, uh, uh, water, and electricity don't, don't mix. Um, Said, Said. Oh, it's Casey's coat off. Good. Well, I'm pleased, to, pleased he's arrived. Um, so maybe it is that the technologies are certainly at the engineering and operational level aren't as compatible as we think, we, think they are, and that may be the true. And, and can we find any other barriers that get in, get in the way? So that on, the, on the assumption at the moment that it, uh, there are some difficulties, the next question linked to, the, to this discussion here is, is it worth trying to stimulate partnerships um, between the water and energy, energy sector? What, what, what benefits could that give? And I do think there are, uh, there are some real advantages that we ought, should, ought to be looking at. And indeed, I think a lot of both water and energy companies are already doing this. Um, and the three perhaps key words there are how do these two vital fluids fit into sustainable development? How do they both link with climate change? What is the growing role of water stress? What impact is that going to have on, um, on utilities? And to what extent can we use the post-2015 development agenda as a catalyst to improve the way we use these, these two very different resources. So I don't know whether there's a sensible question as opposed to Josephina, but that's the ones that I've put into, into my mind frame. So let's, let's start off with some of the key similarities between companies that provide water supply and those that supply energy services. And they're probably pretty obvious um, for most of you. They are almost always a networked service. They de depend on having centers of production of some kind, producing the, the raw material, and then networks to distribute that raw material to the various different kinds of users. I should stress here, I am now not going to be talking about uh, irrigation utilities. I'm purely talking about uh, ur basically urban water supply and electric urban electricity supply. Uh, because of these networks and because of this uh, uh, centralized infrastructure, they all exert a fairly high level of natural monopoly. There is a possibility of a certain degree of competition between these services, but it is a very limited um, possibility. 
they also sell what the economists would call an undifferentiated product. That's to say, you can't tell the difference of the water that comes out of the tap of Canal Isabel and the one that comes out of the tap next door that's provided by, by Veolia, and unless one of them is really abysmal in terms of quality. You, you, you can't tell the difference. And so um, there's no possibility of using price differential uh, to, to mark the quality of the service or, or value added in the service that's provided. They are also, I refer to them in, as fluids, they're absolutely vital for the operation of any modern society from the simple survival level that you have to have a minimum amount of water to hydrate each day to the fact that uh, luxury activities, be it a, a hot shower or your television at night, won't work uh, unless you have one or other and often both of, of these, these things. Um, so that they're very crucial to modern society. And I think it's very important that we remember that when we're talking in terms of the bottom of the pyramid, the reality is that there are probably two and a half billion people on this world who don't have access to adequate water supply to drink or to energy to cook and to use the water to provide food and so on. So there's a very large number of people still on this planet who don't have the services we expect. Um, and providing the services to those people actually needs to, for us to spend more time thinking about the habitat that is being served by both those services and indeed sanitation and one or two others rather than thinking there's an energy problem and as a water problem and unfortunately uh, the production of statistics hasn't really hasn't really helped us in uh, in that context um, which means that water poverty and and energy, energy poverty are a reflection of the sta state of the world and they are generally speaking affecting the same people and finally, we're, going, we're really realizing more and more how the combined impacts of energy, uh, and I'm using shorthand when I'm using the word energy here. Essentially, I'm now talking about electricity or oil. Those are the two things that really we're talking about. The coal coal is, is in the equation, but much, much, much less so. So there, there are real ways we should be thinking about uh, uh, the, the environment and all three of those dimensions of, of energy that I've just been talking about do link directly to all three dimensions of sustainable development, which kind of makes my argument we need to think about it for post-2015. Uh, we need to take that, take that seriously. But uh, there are also some very significant key differences that we need to take into account many of which we talked about yesterday, but, but not all of them. So I'll, I'm going to skip through this slide, not talk about all of them. But the first is the language and concepts used by experts in these uh, two areas, particularly electricity and water supply, are often very different. Uh, and I discovered this five or six years ago when we were kicking off a, a water and energy project in the, OEC, in the WBCSD, and we found the first thing was that it was very difficult to get the engineers to talk to one another. They could talk to one another, but to understand one another. They were using very similar concepts, but totally different words. Um, and perhaps the simplest way, uh, and I, I hope to put in a slide from the experience of, of yesterday in this, is the way the two industries talk about themselves. In the water industry, we talk all the time about the water cycle. Yesterday, we heard people talking about the value chain in energy. Uh, I can't quite remember the term you used, Laurent, but it was definitely um, from, from source to, to, to sink a, approach. Uh, um, as a linear view of e energy and a circular view of, of water. I think also history has caused things to diverge. Um, looking from where we do in the developed world, if you look back 100 years, you would have found, and I've had the opportunities to visit a number of sites where you would have found a municipal electricity, water, gas, sanitation company doing all of those things all together on one site with a tiny gas works, a tiny power station, a tiny water treatment plant, and a tiny sewage treatment plant, all, all in the same place. Water and sanitation have tended to stay at that municipal level for geographical and economic reasons, whereas electricity has tended to expand to, to, to national, if not international level. 
um, which has affected the way people think about these things. It's affected the, the role it plays in planning and a whole host of, of other, other points. Um, I think, given time, I'll skip the rest, but you'll be able to pick those up and under, understand uh, what we're talking about. Now, again, this is going to be a summary of what was said yesterday to a large extent, more than anything else. If you look at water for, for energy, don't the energy people's view of water, what I st struck me first is that most energy planners think simply of, of water as a fuel. Hydroelectricity, it's a fuel. Okay, that's all it is. And it's a very cheap fuel at, at, at that. Um, the next thing is to think of it as an energy transfer system. In other words, they heat it up, make it into steam, drive it through a turbine, and out the other end comes electricity. And so it's pretty important to think about hot water and steam when you're an energy man. It's then considered a pollution remover. Heat, as I said yesterday, is a pollution, um, and, and so steam is an effective way of uh, removing the pollution in the, in the process, which we've talked about a lot. But it's a little less obvious is actually it's very difficult to store electricity, as we always know. One way of storing electricity is to put it into water in some shape or form. Either use surplus electricity to pump it up the hill or uh, keep the water in one place until you want to meet your, meet your peak flow and, and so on. Sometimes it's, it's used uh, in transporting energy around, particularly uh, transporting coal and oil around, around the world, um, but that's not really the kind of water we're talking about today. And increasingly, we ought to take a closer look at the production of uh, water or use of water in the production of fuels. We talked a lot about fracking yesterday, so I, I won't go back to, to that one. Um, but there's also a, a growing realization that the produced water that comes from the oil industry is something that we ought to pay more attention to. But it is very, very highly polluted uh, water and very difficult to handle. But it's interesting to note that in the water engineering world, the focus on um, produced water is, is growing. I think we've also talked significantly over the last couple of days about the links between water uh, and biomass and, and biofuels in energy production. So I won't dwell on, on those and hence water and renewables. Energy, energy for water, uh, the first point is to come back to what I said a few moments ago, we really can't run any modern water service without energy. No energy, no water, no water, no business. So the chain is, is important. And energy efficiency has been a focus of the management of the water industry for a very, very long time. It's certainly not something that's come... Uh, up to us recently, and some of the things that are done to, to help this are uh, pump scheduling of the kind I talked about in my little story earlier on, pumping at the, at the cheap times of day, um, and indeed calculating how uh, carefully the pumps you use are adapted to the loads, mixing variable speed and, and fixed speed pumps and, 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 and so on. Studies on the footprints of the plants you're using uh, in relation to energy are very important. The amount of energy used dependent on the level of treatment. Now, I think it's important to, to, to come back on those two points. Um, we heard yesterday that there are trade-offs. If the cheapest way to um, depollute water is not to pollute it at all, um, and therefore that needs, needs no energy. The, the cheapest way to have good drinking water in a system is not to have to treat it at all. You've got a wonderful source. But once you have to start treating it, you have to think about infrastructure. If you've got loads of space, you don't need to think about using much energy. You can use loads of space and have very slow sand filters and so on, and the energy uh, consumption is very small. If you have very little space um, and you want to produce high-quality uh, water, then you have to l use a lot of energy. And so you win on one and you lose on, on the other, and I think uh, Dominic Gattel will probably give us a, a, a bit more explanation about that. And the same applies to, to treatment level. If you're only trying to treat used water to a primary level, you don't need anything like as much energy uh, as you do if you have to take it on to subsequent process. So uh, in, in design and operation in the water industry, we're always trying to juggle, um, trying to get the best solution between 
um, fixed and variable costs and minimize our, our energy. Uh, some other things that are have to be thought about, have to be recognized, is that when we, when we make a technological jump um, and we have to start using things like desalination technology, which isn't necessarily used just for seawater, um, if we can desalinate brackish water, we would do that first, primarily because of the energy input, but to some extent also about the, the level of uh, technology involved. But we also now realize that in the water industry, we have bits of energy locked up all over the place that if we don't pay any attention to it, it's wasted. And if we pay attention to it, it can be used again. Um, so energy recovery from all sorts of bits of the system uh, is very important. It has been very important for a long time. And, and I think we'll, we'll get some examples of, of that at the moment. And the last point on where it's important to signal energy in water is the, the heat in hot water. Um, we heard from Kathleen on, on Monday the UK case of trying to help the uh, energy companies save energy by encouraging people to save water. And you can say that rule of thumb, uh, the water that you use in your shower is seven times more expensive than the water you use in your cold tap because of the energy in it. Um, and so that heat is uh, to be saved in the first place, but once it's been used and once the hot water's gone somewhere else, it is still possible to recover that heat um, and to use it sensibly, which is something that people are now trying to do more and more. Some of the, the shared issues, and I'm going to run out of time, I'm not careful. Um, everybody in industry and water supply and sanitation, whether it's in the hands of a public operator or a private operator, and we've got both representatives here or whether electricity is in the hands of a public or private operator, we're all the time looking for eternal efficiencies, internal efficiencies to reduce cost. But that's not the only thing that we, we have to do. Um, we also are always very conscious that our customers are looking for continuous reliable supply. So uh, if the energy supply fails to a water system, we have to think, what on earth are we going to do until the energy supply comes back again? Um, similarly, uh, the uh, water, so the energy treatment pl um, production plants can't manage all that long without, without water. So in both cases, we're, we're interested in, in reliability of the other's services. In both cases, system losses, uh, what, what happens between production and, and final consumption and sale? People have a an understanding that there is leakage in water systems, they have a less good understanding that there are also leakages in uh, electricity supply systems. And these leakages in both cases tend to be of two kinds, physical leakages, actually the, the systems let the fluid leak out, and administrative systems, in other words, we don't manage to get uh, charges for everything that, um, that we're delivering. Resource availability and security is a significant issue on, on both sides of the equation. Um, we won't talk any more about those. Political involvement is an extremely important um, dimension and it links a little bit with regulation, but not entirely. Both of these subjects being uh, public, public goods or public services have an uh, inevitable interface with politics at one level or another. The fact that electricity, as I said earlier, tends to be a national subject and water tends to be a local subject complicates the politics enormously. Um, and we often find that public policy at a local level and at a, at a national level and at an international level don't mesh very well. And a huge number of the problems that we face in the water industry arise actually from the flip-flops of politics between the different levels and between the different parties in power at any particular time. And if somehow or other we could overcome those, we'd all be terribly, terribly happy. Um, so that's the sort of first general family of, of shared issues. The, 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 the next is uh, really linked to how do we interact with our, with our users. Um, part of our efficiency depends on the efficient See, of, of the people we are providing the services to. And so we have challenges, some of which are our own and some of which are made by the politicians as to how is the interaction between uh, our users and ourselves 
and our regulators and so on? How do they play out? And we, we, we do try to run programs that give people incentives uh, to behave in different ways and to be aware of what their, what their behavior does. Um, but it's not always terribly useful. And one of, the, one of the studies that I was going to, to flag up was one that's been done recently by, by McKinsey. Uh, and of course, now I can't find it. Uh, where they've been looking at, yes, they've been looking actually at the energy uh, industry in the UK, in, in the US, in relation to um, trying to encourage people to save, save energy. And have found that um, there are various different kinds of people who will... Uh, take up incentives, but very often the incentives don't have a long-lasting effect, um, and you have to keep on renewing those. And the same thing applies to, same things to applies to water. So we've seen quite a lot of you know, appliance codes in Europe, in, in US, that are aimed at saving water, energy, or, or both. People, some people will go to the supermarket and buy a new washing machine, looking carefully at its energy and water consumption. But then they take it home and they don't set the temperature to the optimal temperature. They don't run it on nighttime electricity. So the real savings are, are very small. So the codes are useful. Um, and uh, there's a recent study come out by the Pacific Institute that shows how uh, energy saving in California, for example, has been consistent over the last 20 or 30 years, much less so uh, in, in, in water. But we do know that you can save water by saving energy, and you can save energy by saving water. And somehow or other, we as an industry need to keep um, that going on. Shared issue we also face is that more and more the tariffs are regulated not on the basis of the industrial needs of the infrastructure and, and, and operating it, but on the basis of politics. Uh, we hear politicians so often saying, but I won't get voted in again because my customers will think the electricity is too expensive. So what happens? The electricity uh, company doesn't make the investments and suddenly they start having blackouts. Exactly the same thing happens all the time with water. In fact, water is probably a bit more sensitive to these kind of pressures. So there is a, a real challenge in these industries. People don't understand that even when the services are completely privatized, as is the case with some energy and some water, very small cases, the prices are certainly regulated and, and determined by things that are other than uh, the industrial dimension. And we have to find ways of living with that. And the whole question of, of affordability is something that, um, that Said is going to help us with a little bit in his, in his uh, case. And we talk about management of customers, that's, that's a whole area of expertise in both these industries. Uh, it's not quite the same thing as managing your customers if you're a supermarket. There, there are some very specific challenges that we face. And the segmentation of customers, particularly between dust, domestic, uh, commercial, industrial, is, is really a very, very important. Um, a few other shared issues. Other legal frameworks in which you operate. Different countries have different, different systems and, and they cause uh, challenges you need to face. Um, some really big issues arrive from demographic change. Um, demographic change is mostly the movement of people, but from our point of view, it can also be the movement of industry. And in some places, and I can think of an example in the UK not very long ago, one single industry was contributing 75% of the revenue of a big, a big water company for a big, big city but one individual company disappearing with a huge uh, water consumption made an enormous difference on the, uh, on the way the economics of the whole system worked. Technological evolution in the two, com two uh, fluids is, generally speaking, not on the same line, but one area where we are seeing uh, thought coming together is on the whole idea of smart, smart grids um, and, and smart uh, smart cities now and I, I hope that we may talk about a bit of that later in, in, on in the next session um, and these have impacts on the long term planning of our situation the way they integrate into the, um, the physical territory 
Uh, and the last point that I wanted to make on here is the, the weight of stranded assets in the current systems can have an enormous impact. So I'm just about within the time I intended to, and this is, gives me the opportunity now to introduce my, my three panelists. And we tried to focus on, on three different but related subjects that build on what I've just talked about. So uh, we have Dominic Gattel from, from Veolia, uh, who is going to talk to us about operational water and energy water and energy efficiencies. We have Saeed Shadli from LIDEC, the water, energy, and waste water management company from Casablanca in Morocco. Morocco is an interesting country, and it has several of these contract partnerships that run water and electricity t together. And, and finally, we're going to look at the challenges of water and energy co-production, or managing the two, um, from Ignacio Lozano from Canal Gestion, not very far away from here in, in Madrid. So what I'm going to ask them to do is each of them present just the background of their case very rapidly, and then I will try and conduct a, an interview session with them for a few moments um, to get the, the discussion going, and, and after that, I'd like you to join in the discussion with your own things. Good. So, I will stop the clock and restart it and Dominic would you like me to press the buttons and see what we can do for for you please go ahead yes please um, if you could, could go to the next slide please um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak and good morning to all of you um, I first want to briefly introduce to you what uh, the Olia environment is about um, you can see that uh, we are um, a private operator and partner to cities and also to industry throughout the world. I only show there some major uh, client cities. Um, it's hard to, I mean, to summarize what we are about. I mean, we serve water or wastewater services to 150 million customers throughout the world. Uh, I think that the bottom line is that uh, we are a global network of local water and energy operators uh, servicing both the industry and, uh, and the authorities. And we do have a track record of uh, understanding what uh, our municipal and industrial clients really deeply want to do, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We have uh, three paramount ambitions. Uh, that is to search, develop, and, and implement uh, appropriate solution. Uh, first, to the challenges of complex, large-scale public services uh, throughout the world. And again, I mean, you have uh, uh, some of these on the, on the map there. That's the first thing we, we, we desperately want to do, and we, we have innovation, uh, the innovation department in charge of putting together concepts that can be further developed. The second thing is we want to find uh, solutions, and again, we'll be back to that, and that's definitely to this topic, to the depletion of natural resources, including fossil fuels. That's something which is uh, at the heart of our activity. And the last is we want to uh, develop appropriate solutions to deal with the most challenging pollutions. That's something which is at stake. It hasn't been touched much uh, about so far, but that's uh, something we care for. Water and energy. Uh, for us, uh, it is one of the aspects, major aspects for sure, but that's one of the aspects of the mood, move towards a more circular economy. I mean, we, the, the words hasn't been mentioned so far, but uh, I do believe that that's, this is where uh, we are going. Um, Probably uh, we should go to the next slide. Uh, I think that uh, to start with, and that has been alluded uh, to by um, Jack, um, the cities to start with, they're faced with a number of challenges on their territories. Uh, the, the first one definitely uh, is to, to ensure that the territory is attractive enough for everyone. That means that there has to be an economic uh, perspective offered to the citizens of that territory. Uh, the citizens also show a growing concern for their environment, the air quality, the water quality, and so on. 
And so uh, this is something that we want to, uh, to address. Now, um, regarding the very topic of water and energy, uh, again, uh, Jacques alluded to it, uh, there is this uh, smart notion uh, that certainly did change the rules of the game uh, recently. The ITC enabled a lot more uh, um, real-time data acquisition, which cascades into the possibility to adapt in real time the energy, the water production to the, to the exact needs. So that means that it is now beginning to be possible to optimize in real time uh, the energy intensity of any one process or the water in it, intensity of any one process. And again, uh, this is something which has changed in the recent past and will enable further optimization in any future. Um, on, the, on the scheme there, um, you can see that there's lots of opportunities offered by any one territory in terms of rapproaching water energy utilities to, at, at different levels. I mean, I, I won't go through all the, the signs that are on the map, but you can see that there is uh, water being produced in a number of, of places. There is energy being produced or wasted in different places, and really territories have to jointly analyze the, the two, of, uh, the, the two uh, concepts and see where there is uh, possible to match uh, some wasted energy with an energy demand and conversely uh, wasted water with some water demand. And there's three levels to do that. The first one on the left-hand side is for the entire territory, we have to identify what are the possible sources overall of energy and water. And again, I mean, that's not rocket science. It's been done for uh, forever. But still, this has to be updated. Where do we source the water? Where do we source the energy? At the, um, the side scale, there has to be an analysis to with a view to optimize the energy use and the water use and analysis of the, possible to, the possibility to recycle wasted heat or wasted water. And finally, on the, your right hand side, we have to drive down the consumption of energy on the one hand side, of water on the other hand side. And again, it's been alluded to by, by Jack. And uh, this is why, in the end, the notion of smart city will involve uh, the notion of smart citizen, which will be at the heart of the decision and also of the further development of the energy and water strategy of any one city. Because again, I mean, these are the customers, as Jack uh, touched upon earlier, these, the citizens have to be involved to uh, reduce their energy consumption, to reduce their water consumption, which is needed, and we have to um, cater for that. Last thing on this slide, um, in times of uncertainty, and I think we again are in time of uncertainty, the strategic answer is diversity. I mean, that's always been the case, but that's even more the case now. So the, the, sort of the one solution that fits all is definitely not the appropriate answer. There, there will have to be a number of solutions. And for any one territory, um, I'm deeply convinced that uh, the solution uh, will be in a renewed meshing of both centralized and decentralized solu um, solutions. There will be both. The, the two are really needed. And the meshing of these big and small solutions will be territory specific. Um, I, I like to tell you that uh, in, in 2050, this is going to be the solution. But I, 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 I could, just couldn't do that. What I can tell you is, for the next 10, 20 years to come. This is how I see that there's rapprochement to be made. Um, regarding uh, what we do in concrete terms with, with Veolia about um, water and energy, we certainly do offer to carry out audits 
re, uh, on, on the two uh, with a view to optimize the uh, replacement of the equipment, etc. As Jacques alluded to, um, for, if I take the example of wastewater treatment, that's something which has been developed uh, in the EU, uh, at least Western EU, uh, over the last 30 years or so. It's still under development in the Eastern EU and in many parts of, of the world. And um, for a given removal level, say 90% uh, removal, we can see that at the moment the wastewater treatment plant energy uh, consumption span on a factor 1 to 10, uh, meaning that for whatever reasons, um, um, sometimes oversizing, and so th th there is lots of reasons, but uh, th there is a scope for the reduction of the energy demand of these wastewater treatment plants. We can do that by the replacement of uh, individual um, uh, equipments, um, again with a major speed up, right. <laughs> um, and there's plenty of tools available. If you Google water to energy, you'll, you'll find a, a, a large number of uh, examples. I, I cannot go through the entire list of that. Um, I guess, um, um, yeah, there is, well, probably I should skip that, and maybe we'll come that back to it during the questions. Regarding this uh, question of the SDG uh, that was touched upon again, um, I just wanted to show you there the example of uh, the contract we have this, with the city of Nagpur in, in India. Uh, in Nagpur, there are three million uh, inhabitants. We don't actually know the exact number uh, because uh, one third of them are slum dwellers and we again don't know the exact number. And they are, as you guessed, they are not connected. And they, but anyway, no one uh, did get 24-7 uh, water supply in Nagpur. It's barely two hours of water supply per day. And that means that a huge amount of water is being lost, first in the network, more than 50%, and B, uh, at, um, in, within the homes. I mean, the people use pumps to pump water and store it on the rooftops, and etc. And that cascades in a massive wastage of water. And under the terms of the contract there, within five years, everything will be fixed. All the customers will be connected to the, to the supply and will get 24-7 uh, safe drinking water supply. The important bit is we will use the same assets. So we keep the same assets, we just fix them, and we are confident that in, in term we will minimize the net water abstraction by 10% and conversely minimize the uh, energy consumption by 10% against two days uh, consumption. Next. And last, by the way. Uh, we offer kind of symmetrical services to industry. We also do uh, energy and water audits uh, against benchmarks using all sorts of softwares, both offline and online software for uh, real-time optimization. Uh, we have a portfolio of uh, technologies. Some of them are proprietary, some of them are not from ion exchange all the way to desalination for mine water, for example, with a view to A, minimize the energy consumption that's been paramount for cost reasons, but also nowadays to minimize the water consumption. Uh, I just wanted to repeat there um, something that was touched upon many times uh, across the past two days. Um, Industries, and definitely um, uh, power industries, are more and more concerned about their uh, water footprint and the impact it may have in the future on, on their revenue. So that's something that, again, uh, uh, we partner with the industry to help them sort of uh, single out the best solutions for their uh, footprint, certainly worldwide for the majors. Um, so we have examples like that with um, um, the major oil industry uh, on all continents, Australia, America, etc. Um, we will probably discuss that further and I will stop. I think that uh, on the long run, uh, shared metrics is paramount because that's uh, absolutely needed for people to make coherent decisions. Uh, 
once uh, we have the, uh, an agreement and a total consensus on what are the right indicators, then it is possible to factor, factor that in the conceptions of installations. Uh, yeah, and, and of course, I do believe that there, is, there has to be some mandatory data acquisition on that basis. And uh, the other thing I wanted, and again, we probably will touch upon that uh, later during the questions, is uh, territories must have their local development plans. Uh, it is absolutely necessary. No one can replace them in that function. We can help them. And as con consultants, this is something we do. But ultimately, uh, the territories do have to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominique. I'm in a time management problem already. Um, just to help juggle a little bit, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ignacio to make his short introduction now, and, and then I will return to, to Said because he's just uh, passed me some additional slide material, so we'll have to see whether we can integrate that in or not. So, Ignacio, would you like to introduce yourself and, and, and what, you, what you have to tell us? Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks a lot for... Jack, and for Josefina and your team to, to invite Canal de Salsa de Gestión to this workshop and to the Confederación Hidrográfica del Ebro to, for hosting this, this workshop as well. So first of all, I would like to give you some figures of Canal de Salsa de Gestión Company. Uh, we are responsible for providing water in Madrid region. Uh, we are responsible for providing the whole water cycle services. Uh, water supply, waste, uh, water, and reused water. Okay. Uh, we manage 14 reservoirs in, in Madrid region and with a total storage capacity of about, about 1,000 million cubic meters. Uh, we, we manage the 13 treatment plants uh, with a maximum capacity daily daily maximum capacity of four, uh, about, uh, about 4.5 million cubic, meter, million cubic meters. And we match a distribution network uh, with a length about uh, 17,000 kilometers um, with for, for, uh, 20, 24 big tanks, uh, big water tanks, um, about 250 small water tanks. Okay. As well, we are providing sewage uh, service. Okay, we collect water. Uh, we 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 handle uh, about 2,000 2,000 uh, kilometers of the network, including the municipality networks and the uh, big uh, uh, pipes which uh, collect uh, the, the the wastewater from different municipalities. We manage well uh, 154 water treatment plants. Um, we treat it uh, more or less every year about 525 uh, million cubic meters, and that's the, that's the data from 2012. And we are also providing a new service. This is the reduced water service where we are providing 25, uh, well, we, 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 we have installed 25 facilities. And the length of the water service, of the reduced water service, is uh, about 250 kilometers. And these are the main figures of the company. Okay. So, I, so regarding water and energy, and energy nexus, uh, um, Canal de Segunda is one of the major con uh, electricity consumers consumers in Madrid region. Okay. We are in southern Europe. Uh, most of the part of Spain territory is dry. Only one fourth of our territory is very wet, and we are in the in the middle of Spain. And middle of Spain is the, the climate and the rainfall is uh, we have scarcity of, of rainfall in the in there, and that's why uh, our consumer of energy varies one year from another uh, because it depends on the rainfall and it depends on the starting water reserves uh, in, at the beginning of the year. Uh, I mean, we have of the hydrological year, okay? And so that involves that uh, the using of energy varies a lot from one year, uh, for instance, from 2011 to 2012. And as you see in the, in the graph, uh, which are some different years from 2009 to 2012, there's a big difference of consumption 
between or oh, this difference uh, is up, up to 200 gigawatts hour and it's, it's a big amount of energy of electricity okay and this this difference is due to uh, mainly to to our water uh, supply requirements okay um, um, when we are in a in a period with a sh uh, of, uh, of draft in, in a draft period of shortage okay rain uh, I mean water shortage uh, we need to pump water not from the, our highest reservoirs so we need to pump I mean not, we are not taking the water from uh, by gravity from our highest reservoirs uh, so we, are, we need to take the um, uh, a more expensive water from the lowest reservoirs and that involves to pump water up to 200 meters height and also we are using uh, ground water wells okay um, of all our consumption more or less a bit less than 50% is demanded by water supply service and a bit more than 50% is demanded by by wastewater service so the demand of waste water service is very stable so it's much it's pretty much predictable but it's not the same to the water supply service so our electricity generation okay um, we are in Madrid region uh, we are the, the largest company with uh, with uh, the big I mean with the largest uh, in generation generation capacity installed up to 82 megawatts and all these megawatts were has been always related with water okay we are in fact um, uh, a water company but we need to to develop uh, all these uh, megawatts because we were closely closely related with water so as you can see in the in the graph um, in the the green color in, in, in the base of the graph and the graph is a biogas a generation it's very stable and also it's very stable the 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 orange color that that means the the the, the uh, drying drying uh, it's, it's a thermal process where uh, where we uh, dry uh, it's sludge, uh, sludge in in a coordinated plant okay um, but you you can appreciate that in uh, the blue uh, color is the hydro energy that which is generated and of course uh, it varies a lot uh, depending on the year so that's uh, we have to make we have to make a, a big effort in the shortage periods because we are not able to produce energy so we are not able to consume that energy and at the same moment we have to make a bigger effort while providing the service so it's even more expensive for us that is a very important point for us so what we are doing at this point okay we are mainly we are uh, we are acting in three measures the first one is increasing a new uh, renewable energy for instance we are installing micro turbines in our network in our uh, water supply network okay um, in the wastewater services we are developing biogas cogenerated uh, plants as well we it's not only a problem for us the problem of energy is not only a problem of kilowatts hour also it's a problem of uh, um, of um, euros the euros that we are spending so we are advancing uh, in, in purchasing the energy uh, with the cheapest price as we can um, this in this imply uh, this involves that we need which is a public tender process because we are a public company so that means uh, that we have to to start a tender process and in this process it's an, an auction and we want the the energy providers to to we, now, we want to have a competition between the energy providers and there are two rounds in the in the energy purchase okay just to allow us to to buy cheaper the energy and as well we are able to choose the moment where we are buying the energy okay if we buy the energy in one moment of the year we are we are in the market we will will we are inter i mean we are affecting the mar the market because the price we, we are buying a lot of energy so we can choose to buy energy in six periods of the time of the year okay 
And the last, in the, in the, the last step, or the last measure that we are doing is just to optimize the, um, the, uh, the optimis I mean, to optimize our processes. And there are a lot of processes that where we use your energy in, in water supply, in wastewater. In wastewater, of course, is very complex. What you are managing as well the wastewater treatment plant, and you you have to to fulfill the requirements of the of the authorities. But as well, you have to manage energy, so it's complex in, in these facilities. Um, also, we are impl implementing, or well, what we of course we are in, we, we have implemented uh, some models. An example is a model that uh, shows us when we need to pump energy in order to get the better the, the best price um, to save uh, money while pumping the energy, and that's why what we do when we are pumping uh, uh, water from uh, the uh, Alberche River Basin, or from the, uh, the, the Alberche River, that I told you before, it was like uh, we, we needed to pump water uh, uh, up to 200 meters. And this is a fast, fast overview of what we are doing in Canal de Isabel Segunda Gestión. Ignacio, thanks, thanks very much. Um, if we could change things over. While, while, we, while we're doing that, uh, Ignacio, can I, can I ask you the first, the first question um, that, that I had indicated for you? Um, in, uh, in your process of in investing in renewable energy um, in Spain, is this just a, a cost issue, or do you think there are, there are other reasons why you should be investing in renewable energy? Okay. I, uh, first... Uh, we, 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 we care about the price of the, I mean, it's going to be profitable to do this, this investment, but uh, what, I mean, the, the framework now is in, in Spain, well, some, well, uh, in Spain, I mean, okay, is that the demand in water services is increasing uh, by what to uh, follow the European directives in, mainly in wastewater treatment plants, and that requires uh, the, the more use of, of energy, okay? But at the same time, we would be able or, well, we, we, yeah, to produce more energy, but now the Spanish framework is not very uh, uh, profitable. I mean, we, we are not taking profit of it because we, now if we install new renewable um, um, uh, facilities or power plants, uh, we are going to sell the energy uh, in the pool market as any other technology. So, for, uh, um, uh, on, the, um, once, uh, on the first hand, we, we need to, to use more energy, but on, on, the, on the other hand, uh, we can produce more energy because it's not profitable. And so, what are we doing? We are trying to use that ener energy for self-consumption because there are regulated, regulated tariffs that we are not avoiding to, to pay the, the pool price but oh, uh, we are saving as well the, regu the, the regulated price. Eh? So, but we would like to be able to also to produce some part of energy that is not self-consumed uh, to the market. But now it's in this moment in Spain, energy market is, is, is a difficult moment. So it's not the best moment. So, so this is a very interesting illustration of the point we made earlier on about the interface between politics, uh, regulation, and operational practice, and maybe we can discuss that in our panel session uh, a, a little bit more. And uh, Dominic, maybe you'd like to think about that question while while uh, Said is making his his presentation on on Casablanca. So, Said, uh, over to you. Try and be fairly rapid because we are running out of time already. Uh, you may need to press the. Good morning to all of you. Uh, my English uh, is bad, uh, so I, I will speak uh, broken English but my colleague Jack uh, will uh, help me to formulate my answer in the, the third uh, phase. No problem. Uh, Casablanca uh, is the largest city uh, in Morocco with uh, 5 million inhabitants, uh, the leading uh, industrial center with 55% uh, of the country's production units and almost 60% of the industrial labor force. Uh, 16% of the national electricity uh, consumption, 45% uh, of Morocco's foreign trade uh, goes uh, uh, through uh, its port, uh, a constructed surface area multiplied by 
150 in less than a century. Ah, bah non. Euh, L'IDEC, euh, c'est bon C'est bon. Euh, historical operator of uh, services in the, the greater Casablanca area for delegated services, water distribution, electricity distribution, wastewater uh, collection and treatment, storm water collection, public lightning. Uh, a 30 uh, year management contract signed in 1997 around 3,500 employees. Uh, listed on Casablanca's stock exchange uh, market. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the good one, uh, I think. Uh, it's not, huh? the, uh, uh, not on the right uh, presentation. No, not on the right well, presentation. We'll have to manage without. <laughs> uh, Casablanca, 20% uh, 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 lived in uh, uh, substandard housing. Uh, yes. No. If you can find the right one. Okay. Well, while 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 all that's going going on, perhaps I should try and use the use the time by asking um, some of the other questions that that, that I uh, I talked about. Um, Dominic, we. We both recognize that the regulatory framework is absolutely fundamental and you highlighted that you probably wanted to come back to that subject in the, in the discussion. Would you, would you like to make some points on, on, on regulation? Yeah. Um, the, the, the first thing I, that I think with regards to regulation that has to be said is that um, Energy is of paramount importance, and so is water. With regards to the future that uh, we want to, um, definitely the major impact of global change, climate change to start with, but also demographic change, uh, are going to be through uh, water. And that has to be properly, uh, appropriately catered for in the, um, in the regulations. Um, I think that there's uh, two prerequisites uh, for effective uh, water and energy policies. The first one is a top-down commitment at the political level. And the second one I already touched upon is mandatory performance assessment using, again, appropriate and uh, shared uh, metrics. Uh, the rest is very, um, I mean, well recognized. I mean, of course, there is, there is a need for integrated water resource management, uh, and I would def definitely uh, recommend that you read again all the OECD material about all of that, because that's really the start, starting point. Uh, because uh, the R, uh, sorry, integrated resource management is the appropriate way to allocate water fairly, etc., and that should never be forgotten about. Uh, the second thing, which is uh, Again, um, is, it is for regulators to set tax incentives uh, f to put the pressure uh, on the non-desired outcome. And at the same time, uh, it is for regulator to allow profit to be made for the desirable outcomes. I mean, I, I think both are part of the game. And for the uh, long term, um, again, I think that the value of territory and their social development will span from a better resource management. I already touched upon that at the very start of my talk, saying that basically uh, this uh, um, conference, uh, we see this topic of water and energy as one major driver of the overall uh, move towards a more circular economy. So, and again, uh, I think it is for uh, regulators to enforce a policy based on, on these metrics I touched upon. And again, territories at national and more regional and city level 
have to set their, their, their own very own development plan, which caters for the triple bottom line, social development, environmental protection, are paramount. So, um, in a nutshell, these are the elements which I recommend to, to, for the regulators. I, I know they already do, and again, Dominic, uh, sorry, Kathleen, uh, I mean, made a brilliant presentation about it on Monday, and uh, that's the way to go, I believe. Ignacio, you're, you're in a slightly different position from, uh, uh, from Dominic in that your company is a state-owned or a, a municipal-owned uh, organization. Do you see the same pressure uh, in regulation of your activity as, as Dominic has described? Mm, yeah, maybe, but um, you are referring in, in, in energy, I mean? Uh, energy and water. Uh, mm, no, well, in some, maybe in some aspects, but mm. not, uh, no, no, it's not a, for us a problem uh, for us now. Mm. I mean, no, not big. But you, you need to be, have clear guidelines, clear, uh, clear constraints uh, defined by the, by the city in the same way that, that, that Dominic yeah. sees it. Yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I, 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 it seems to me to be a lot of people try all the time to make a difference between public and private operation, and many, but many of the things are exactly the same. And the yeah, but we, 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 we do care about our efficient. Yeah. Uh, um, efficient, so we... We, we all do. <laughs> okay, so from, for me it's not a matter of private uh, no. public, it's a matter of efficiency. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's what we, what we, all, we would all concentrate on. Okay, as okay. Uh, say, um, please, please go quickly okay. because we are, we are running badly out of time now. Uh, next. Next. Uh, next one. Uh, in Casablanca, the, the, the perimeter of... Uh, 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 management of uh, water, wastewater and electricity is different. Uh, you have in uh, yellow municipalities supplied by uh, LIDEC with water, sanitation, electricity and public lightning. Uh, in uh, uh, green uh, municipalities supplied by water uh, sanitation and in blue uh, 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 electricity uh, only. Uh, the prices uh, for purchase and sale uh, water and electricity in Casablanca are fixed uh, by authorities. Uh, ce sont les arrêtés uh, ministériels et les décisions uh, du comité technique de suivi. So those are declared by the, the ministry and then the uh, organization that follows the performance of the contract. We have three levels uh, of uh, price uh, equalization, uh, a national level, uh, we have uh, purchase uh, of water and, water and price uh, above calculated uh, 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 production. We have a level, uh, contractual level according uh, to the delegated management contract allowing multi-services. Uh, the income from power distribution activity are used uh, to finance water and uh, wastewater uh, infrastructures. And at uh, 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 the end, the uh, price equalization, uh, social equalization, uh, uh, application of a, a, a social tariff. Next one, please. You have here uh, the, 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 the bracket uh, for, for water and uh, electricity. 60% uh, of volume consumed by households is within the first, the, the two bracket. The, the price are given in uh, dirham. It's uh, 11.11 .11, uh, for uh, dirham, uh, cost one, one euro. Next one. 58% uh, Households consume less than uh, eight cubic meters, uh, which correspond at uh, four uh, euros per month. Uh, in electricity, 45% uh, households consume less than 100 kilowatts.
which is uh, approximately 10 euro per month. All households pay for the first uh, eight uh, meter cu uh, uh, cube meters less expensive than the price that LIDEC uh, uh, paid to uh, the, 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 the producer. Uh, six, uh, Sixty uh, percent of volume consumed by the, the household is within the, the, the first two uh, brackets uh, for water. Next. Next. Uh, here you have, uh, with, with the, um, uh, perhaps, we will pass to the project Indochina. No, no, avant, avant, avant. Après, après. Uh, uh, now I will uh, uh, speak about uh, uh, a project in uh, uh, sh social uh, uh, project, LIDEX intervention in informal settlements. Next. 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 No, no. Avant, 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 avant. Voilà. Uh, LIDEX signed uh, an agreement in uh, 2005 with Greater Casablanca, Wilaya, the local authority of Ministry uh, Home Affairs in charge of uh, such uh, agreement, uh, aimed to uh, offering uh, underprivileged neighborhood uh, ac uh, access to uh, utilities. LIDEC created uh, in uh, uh, 2006 uh, a department with uh, uh, 70 people dedicated to manage uh, technical, institutional, and uh, client aspects of the, the project uh, for uh, uh, about uh, 80,900 uh, uh, households uh, to connect to water, wastewater, and electricity. Uh, we, we, you have here uh, K uh, figures. Uh, it's about 276 neighborhoods for a project financial situation is about 163 million euros. Je continue. Oui. D'accord. Donc, the, the impact, the, the NDH project and the, all its donors have contributed to bring many changes in these uh, neighborhoods that were uh, hitherto uh, deprived of their infrastructures. The main impact generated by the, the connections to electricity, uh, water and wastewater facilities include the uh, increased awareness by uh, the people authorities, which will eventually release investments to upgrade neighborhood facilities. The near immediately construction investment like construction of first floor, uh, facade renovation or sanitation facilities, a more uh, bustling neighborhood life. Women and children usually bear the burden of water collection uh, once uh, households are connected, the time previously spent to uh, uh, this task can be invested uh, in other activities uh, and more specifically on education. W women can learn to, to read and to write and eventually take part in the, the neighborhood life and develop associative uh, activities. For instance, they organize small income generating projects like embroidery and sewing workshop, with, uh, which provide them additional revenue. For children, especially for the little girls, uh, a return to normal schooling is widely observed. How we manage uh, uh, oper uh, uh, operational point uh, uh, of uh, the, the project? Uh, the, the first step consists of uh, carrying out all 
paperwork, technical and uh, contractual uh, work to prepare the transaction. For instance, pre-qualification pre uh, operation, uh, partnering to land, planning, technology, population, f founding, etc., and carrying out studies on water, sanitation, and electricity, among other things. Uh, then uh, comes the land acquisition uh, procedures for uh, joint projects and uh, the establishment of a list of beneficiaries to be approved by the authorities. In the second phase, we carry out the re realization of the scope of uh, delegated management, task for uh, which uh, uh, funding is uh, available. Finally, before, uh, during, and after uh, the work, our role is to assist beneficiaries in every phase on the operation. What are the uh, challenges of uh, supplying uh, uh, electricity, water, and sanitation services uh, on those disadvantaged neighborhoods? Uh, for this project, there were, uh, there were four major challenges. First of all, the, the informal nature of districts involved. There are illegal lots that have proliferated erratically on uh, public uh, or private land without any administration authorization. This generates a lot of land title problems. The second one, the resident, the re resident acceptance of the project. Of the project. Uh, resident who until 2005 were regarded as illegal with no right to access the city's basic services. Third of one, coordination between various uh, program stakeholders, local and national government, public and private operators, donors, association. And the, the, the last, uh, the, the financing problem that is not uh, uh, resolved uh, yet. Uh, how we, uh, we uh, overcome these challenges? Uh, on two levels, socially, Day-to-day -day dedicated support on the, the ground for the the duration of the project, allowing residents to uh, switch from the illegal statute to that of customer of public services. Uh, a financial co contribution of 360 euros per household to access water and uh, electricity and sanitation to be spared over seven years. This contribution represents 10% of the connection costs, while the monthly uh, 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 installment does not exceed 5% of the household budget. Uh, the improvement of community services. The, the third uh, level, the, the second level, pardon, uh, at the institutional level, preparing of the operation and monitoring of the partners' commitment, the specific governments with the relevant authorities. The approach is now operational and functioning well. The only challenge remain is uh, the, the financial uh, uh, challenge that uh, uh, cost uh, approximately uh, seven, 70 uh, er, uh, million euros. Uh, we have uh, some uh, time? Not much no. more, no. Uh, key factors behind success of our approach in Casablanca. The, the first factor is contributing, uh, contributing to access of Casablanca approach is the political will. It translates into a national institutional framework, the National Initiative for Human Development, initiated by His Majesty King Mohammed VI, in May uh, uh, 18, 2005, it gives priority 
uh, to the fight against social exclusion and access to basic services to the private population, populations. Other factors of success are the involvement of uh, the national and supervision authorities, Ministry of Interior, who are responsible for monitoring achievements and providing feedback on the, the pilot, on, uh, on, uh, on the, the, the project acti activities. Second one, the local authorities, elected representative and authorities of the state uh, government involvement, who are crucial in recognizing and mobilizing of the inhabitants of disadvantaged neighborhoods, as well addressing any barriers, particularly in regards to land and uh, property issues. The presence of institutional players, such as uh, the World Bank, uh, who uh, bring international credibility to the project design and uh, also uh, actively participate in removing various obstacles to the project's success. And finally, the dedicated project uh, staff of uh, 70 uh, people <coughs> provided by DDEC uh, uh, in uh, 2006. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Saeed. <laughs> now, I'm, a, I'm afraid my time management hasn't been as good as I planned, so I think um, we've got uh, no more than 15 minutes left for discussion. So um, I'd very much like to see whether there's anybody in the room who have questions or observations that they would like to make on, on what they've heard this morning about the combination of water and electricity, water and energy in, in utilities. Anybody got observations on what we've, what we've learned so far? Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to make a, a short comment on uh, your introductory remarks. Uh, you indicated that there are not so much partnerships uh, for water and energy utilities. Uh, I want to say that there is some development in Africa. And uh, this year, for the first time, we have uh, um, energy utilities and water utilities coming together in a huge Nexus meeting in, in May. So between uh, 13th and 16th of May, we have these uh, two utilities coming together for the very first time. And this is a very significant uh, development. That, that, that's great, and of course that shows that the international year is, is starting to do, its, to do its stuff. It seemed to me, listening to the, to the three case studies here, that the, the need for a closer link between water and energy in, in thinking from operational level, from planning level, and so on is really important. But today, uh, a lot of it's going on informally uh, rather than in a structured way, and, and maybe one of the outcomes of this coming year will be that we'll find better ways of, of structuring these things together than we did in the past. So my, my question is to Ignacio, because I got the impression that your organization tries to be self-sufficient in terms of energy. Have you ever explored a possible partnership with an energy uh, company in your region to see how you can mutually um, support each other? Well, uh, I, at this moment, you know, when I said that we were, we are not self-efficient. We, we, we are using the, our energies, or, um, a big part of the energy, of the energy that, that we are generating, in self-consumed, in self-consumption. Okay. And, uh, now we are about 50% of our energy demands. We are uh, is self-consumption. Okay. In, in, in big terms, okay, uh, we're saying, because if we consider the energy that we are saying out by the mi mini hydro plants, uh, the balance is 50%, okay, but not, it's, it's not real self-consumption because not all the energy that the mini hydro plants uh, uh, is, 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 is providing uh, to, uh, directly to our company, okay. So probably the self-consumption really is not 50% in means, no? It can be lower because power the mini mini hydro mini hydro power plants are selling their energy, okay? But um, another big part is self uh, consumed, okay? But of course we want to improve our energy uh, self consumption in order to 
to, to be more efficient in our, in our processes. Okay? And this is very important because as we saw to, uh, as, we, as we heard yesterday, uh, we, are not, we, we, don't, we, we are not only in the framework of the uh, water di the directives that we, use, uh, we need to, to use more energy because we are demanding more energy, but at the same time we have to, to follow the 2020 European Dry Directive. So we are, and I think that the water sector has to be a good example uh, for, for that, uh, 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 for, for following both uh, directives. Uh, my question is to Mr. Uh, Lozano. Uh, like you said, uh, your company is also produce electricity and also you supply water. So what is the management structure uh, inside the company? How can you manage it like the partnership you just okay. within the company? Okay. Early, uh, you have something, you work on the improved efficiency like water supply, energy supply at the same time and also to produce energy and water to your customers, okay. but what is the management okay. kind of structure in the company and it's okay. how can you just show this could be the good like kind of model for the other companies to look for? Okay, okay. Yeah. I think that's an interesting question because yeah. we, we often yeah. find, as I said, different languages, um, different technologies yeah. and bringing them together is yeah. a challenge. So yeah. The, uh, our, our, our main goal, the company main goal is to guarantee water supply in both in both quantity and quality. To, to, to all its customers, but at the same time we have to protect uh, even improve, improve the, the, the environment, okay? So when we are taking care of water, when we are moving water, in real, in fact, we are moving energy, okay? And when, when we are saving water, it's the best measure to save energy. The less water our uh, um, um, clients uh, consume, the less energy they consume as well. So both things are related together. But always in our company, uh, uh, our aim is to, pro to provide to warranty water supply. Okay, it's not. I mean, uh, the, the the energy is always uh, subordinated under the water processes in order to be more efficient, and that's in our aim, okay? Uh, and one way of being more efficient is to, 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 uh, to produce more energy and to save energy. Okay, I've got a gentleman here who I think wants to give us a, 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 a thumbnail case study. Yeah, uh, very shortly. Um, my name is Andy Backer. I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of Sustainable Reference. We've got offices in Silicon Valley, here in Spain, and in Costa Rica. And we develop a software platform. Um, imagine LinkedIn, but aimed towards sustainability, where every company, every citizen, even each institution, public, can have a profile where they can identify all the sustainable practices that they do at the private level, at the corporate level, at the institutional level. And then, um, well, we use like a, a point game system. We also hook up with smart meters to gauge your consumption in er energy, water, etc. Um, in short, we're engaging in Costa Rica with the public sector, um, NGOs such as the Rainforest Alliance, with banks, with uh, electrical utilities and um, and Spanish, uh, not Spanish, uh, and water utilities, uh, Heredia, for example. And our goal is to reduce um, energy and water consumption by having the citizens, the companies, um, uh, know what pays off uh, in, in short, um, the ROI, return of investment, uh, very quickly, and they can gauge, they can co compete against the citizens um, we've got an application that uh, people can download on the, on the mobile. Uh, well, <laughs> the presentation is a bit chaotic, but the point being is, again, imagine like a LinkedIn profile for citizens, companies, where you can show what you're doing in terms of sustainability, and you're competing nationwide against other corporations, against other citizens towards being more sustainable. So IT solutions are nowadays offering a way of engaging the citizen, the corporation, the NGOs in a much more um, interesting way. And I'm wondering if any of uh, the panelists are 
or also engaging in ICT and citizens in, in any of these ways. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, I can assure you that uh, uh, the many activities of that kind uh, are going on. I'm aware certainly of in several of the companies I represent. But um, Dominique, you, you perhaps uh, would like to come in on that, on that point, the, uh, the optimization uh, approach in, in the smart. I think that's basically what we're talking about in the smart context. Well, um, I don't know how to make it short for the sake of time because, I mean, obviously there is a... I'm sure uh, Josephine is going to just uh, have uh, a few minutes more. A large array of, uh, of, of matters that were uh, targeted in, in, in that statement. Uh, the dialogue with citizens and the NGOs is certainly some, something which is at stake there and has to be appropriately... Uh, it has to happen one way or another. And certainly the IT tools do help quite a great deal with it. Um, and sorry to stress that even further, but I think that over the long run, appropriate data to support the choices are paramount. And oftentimes, uh, at the moment, the dialogue is somewhat biased by the lack of shared data, which, I mean, as soon as there is enough data out showing the water impact, the energy impact of any one choice, frankly, the consensus comes a lot easy, more easy, easily when you have such shared data on, again, on, on metri uh, metrics which are agreed upon by everyone. And as, soon, as long as you don't have them, then you struggle quite a lot to, to to finally uh, go towards an acceptable solution for, say, I was up to say everyone, there is a great deal of politics. We you alluded to uh, yesterday saying, well, if the farmers uh, do not have uh, any further perspective regarding biofuels, they're going to be seeking some other ways to be funded one way or another. And that's certainly something which is at the heart of today's discussion. And also uh, two days ago was alluded to the sort of unbalanced powers between the energy sector and the water sector. And that's also one of the dimensions. But again, once the, the, the metrics are in place, then people I mean, know what's their margin of maneuver, and that's paramount. Um, but but uh, IT, I mean, uh, uh, from a totally different perspective with regards to the techniques, yes, I mean, IT technologies, it, for example, I just will take an example. The possibility to get real-time uh, information regarding the temperature in the buildings for, uh, in a city like Saragossa enables, I don't know whether there is a heat supply, a centralized heat supply in Saragossa, but that's, that's typically the sort of thing which is now, nowadays possible for the heat networks managers to adapt in real-time the heat production so that there is no excess heat or heat wasted. So that's from a totally different perspective, one of the direct application of the IT technologies. And again, I mean, it was not possible, say, 10 years in the past. Now it is kind of current practice. Uh, th th thank you, Dominique. Uh, uh, I think that the, the information problem uh, comes back to the, to some extent, to the, to the language problem that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we're set up in a world with there are not just sunk assets in terms of physical sunk assets, but they're intellectually sunk assets in, and, and compartmentalized assets. So most of us, I and mean, I have several wonderful stories of talking to uh, people who are ministers of water and energy, but they can't actually uh, think uh, water and energy simultaneously in their own minds and their staff can't support them because they have a, a, a water staff and an, an energy staff. Um, some of the modern data mining techniques that you, you referred to are beginning to enable us to, uh, uh, to break, those, break those, things, uh, those things down. Josephina, my little machine has just told me I've run out of time. Um, can I just take a couple of seconds to try to summarize? We have half an hour on the coffee break, so you can, if you want to take away a little bit of the coffee break. Well, I don't, I don't want to disabuse people by taking away the, top, top, the, the coffee break, but I, I would just like to try to summarize two or three Key points which I think uh, uh, have come out from, from this exercise, from the preparation, from, uh, from what my colleagues have presented and, and uh, the odd questions we've had. And, and I think uh, we have 
certainly shown that all on, and on all three dimensions of sustainable development, which is something that I believe in, in passionately and I think is the only way our planet is going to survive uh, its overpopulation and so on in the years to come, is that we look much more at how to manage the interfaces and the synergies between very important uh, natural resources, which effectively is what we're talking about when we talk about energy and water. We can't, we can't survive as human beings without energy, water, and, and, and various other resources. So the, the, case, the, study, the case, I think, is made. The, the challenge of how to do it is beginning to be exposed, and I think we're beginning to show quite clearly that working in boxes with contained technologies is mankind's natural way of doing things, but we have to find ways of getting beyond that. And, and this nexus word uh, has got to be moved from uh, theory to reality somehow. Um, that won't happen in five minutes, but it will happen with initiatives like this conference and like uh, the, the coming year when water and energy are going, to be, are going to be brought together. So I think we're on the, I think we're on the right track. I think we've got enormous challenges um, to, to face us, and I thank all of you for coming here and listening to this, this session. I hope it integrates into the rest of the, the discussion well, and I would particularly like to thank my, my three panelists who were chosen for, for diversity and competence, and I think they've both demonstrated that, and I'm sure all three of them, like me, are frustrated that we only had an hour and a half instead of a day and a half, because then we could have really told you something about the subject. But, but, but there you go. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy your coffee, which you will realize is a combination of water, energy, and certain nutrients. Please enjoy it. <laughs>